Chapter 2. The Combats It was early the next week, and Cam and I were on our way to Kofor. Our village, Korana, was the smallest of the three main villages in our area. Locksfield and Kofor were the other two, with Kofor being the largest. The combats were about to begin, and although I wasn't interested in participating, it was a gathering place for lots of kids our age and was usually a good time. Almost a thousand people lived in Kofor, and they hosted the combats and often boasted the champion. So are you going to ask Alita to the Evenstide Festival this year? Cam asked. He tried to sound serious, but I knew he was teasing. Oh, I don't know if I have to. She's been pining at my door ever since last year, I joked back. Alita. I guess it was pretty obvious that I was enamored with her. She was, by far, the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. I would have given anything to be able to have just one normal conversation with her. But every time I tried, something would go horribly wrong. Last year's Evenstide Festival was a prime example. I had spent months working up the courage to ask her to go with me. I would practice my invitation speech on trees and rocks and animals, each time making little improvements here and there until I was certain I had it down perfectly. It was a week before the festival, and I knew that if I didn't do something soon, it would be too late. Cam had caught me talking into a mirror and had made some joke mimicking Alita's voice. After I caught him and pounded on him for a while, he looked at me seriously. Come on, Taryn, just talk to her. The worst that can happen is that she will say no. I wish that he was right, but I found out that worse things can happen. Still, buoyed by his encouragement, I decided to put my plan into play. The rain that had been falling steadily for a couple of weeks had finally let up, and I determined that the next morning it was do or die. The ground was a slick pile of sludge and muck as I carefully made my way to my intended destination. I had scoped out the scene a lot over the past few months and was confident in my selection. It was a small hill that rose a mere fifteen feet above the road. There was a young sapling that stood near the top, and I felt that its statement of strength and potential would provide a strong subtext to my own youthful vitality. Every morning, Alita and her best friend, Said would walk down that road heading towards the bakery where they worked making bread. The hill stood just to the east of where they would pass, and I knew that if I stood atop it, and everything went according to plan, the sun would rise just behind me as they came along. Climbing the hill was slightly trickier than I anticipated, and it took me several tries because I kept slipping back down. I was glad that I had decided to make an early start that morning, because no sooner had I reached the top when I heard the sounds of conversation coming down the road. I recognized Alita's beautiful voice immediately, and my heart began to race. It was all I could do to keep myself from escaping down the other side of the hill, but I forced myself to calm down and recommit to carry through with the whole thing. In my mind, what I saw happening was this. Alita would just come within sight of the hill, and I would call her name. I had practiced this many times, and felt that I had come up with the perfect tone and cadence for the job. She would look up to where I was leaning casually against the tree, hands in my pockets, a look of calm assurance on my face. The sun would rise behind me, outlining me in a glorious aura of splendor. Her breath would catch in her throat, as I stepped towards her, my hand outstretched to receive hers. That was the scene I pictured in my imagination countless times over the past months. It wasn't, however, what actually happened. Now, some of the things were the same. She came inside of the hill, the sun rose behind me, I called her name, but everything went wrong after that. I took one step towards her, and my foot slipped wildly on the soggy hillside. For some reason, I thought it would look too ridiculous to fling my arms out trying to catch a hold somewhere, so I just kept them in my pocket, as if maybe she wouldn't notice my falling if I didn't draw attention to it. I landed hard on my back and began to slide down the hill, slowly rotating as I descended. I came to a stop by bumping my head into her feet. I was covered in a complex mixture of mud and shame. Taryn? she asked. Hey, I replied, trying to sound as casual as possible. W what are you doing? She continued as she looked back up the hill to where I had fallen. Uh, nothing, I replied. Okay, well, have a nice day. You too, I replied congenially. 
They walked on, and I'm sure I heard them giggling. At least they held it until they were almost out of earshot. I just lay there, wet muck soaking into my back. Eventually I got up and trudged dejectedly back home. That was almost a full year ago now, but I still felt my face reddened whenever I was near her. She never mentioned the event and had even tried to carry on a conversation with me several times since then. I always felt like my mouth was full of rocks whenever I tried to talk back. It was hopeless. I was destined to only pine for her from afar. Well, you've still got a couple of months, Cam went on cheerfully. Maybe you'll get your chance. Yeah, I replied with very little conviction. Heard anything more about what happened last week, Cam asked. No, you? Not a thing. I was thinking I should talk to Toll about it. Toll was my adopted father. He and his wife, Shia, had taken me in after my mother had died. No one seemed to know what happened to my real father. I never thought too much about it. They loved me and I loved them. Our home was a happy one. You think that's a good idea? Cam asked. I don't know, I replied. I guess just seeing the mist and everything made me think of my mother. I, th I thought that maybe Tall would be able to help me make sense of things. Yeah, maybe, Cam replied noncommittally. The walk from Coroner to Kofer took about an hour and a half, and Cam talked most of the way there. In my estimation, he never really said anything of great importance, but I loved hearing him all the same. He would comment on the same landmarks he always commented on. He would tell some inane joke and then laugh himself silly at the punchline. He filled every silent minute. As a result, the walk was pleasant and passed by swiftly. We arrived in Kofer and made our way directly to the arena. It was a large fenced area covered by an immense tent. There were concession booths and even a parade route along the way. The committee in Kofer must have spent weeks preparing for the combats, and though there was some jealousy amongst the other towns because they couldn't host it, there was also a lot of relief that they didn't have to do all the work. Let's grab something to eat and then go check out the preliminary matches, Cam suggested excitedly. My cousin Greg is competing this year for his first time, though I don't think he's going to get very far. Even I can take him down. Laughing, we stopped in at one of the concessions. A boar had been roasting over a fire, and for a few pennies we could get a satisfying chunk of meat with a bun. We ate our food with great satisfaction, Cam making loud noises of contentment as he chewed. We arrived at the arena just as a match was finishing. A boy from Locksfield had just beaten a boy from Kofer, and the small collection of Locksfield fans were making an impressive ruckus with their cheers. Cam saw Greg and waved him over. Greg must have grown since Cam last saw him because, although they were the same height, Cam was a good deal broader across the shoulders. I couldn't imagine him having much difficulty beating Cam now. Cam, Greg called warmly as he approached. You're just in time. I'm up after this next bout. Awesome, replied Cam and smacked Greg on the shoulder good-naturedly. Need any pointers before you head in? I think I'm good, Greg responded. But I'll try to remember all the moves you taught me though I don't think we're allowed to stick our fingers in our opponent's ears. That was my signature move, pouted Cam. Greg laughed and headed back to prepare for his bout. Cam and I rested our arms on the fence and waited for the event to begin. Hey, Taryn, a voice said behind us. Still not man enough to compete? I knew who it was without even having to look. Still, I turned around to see a group of boys standing there with smug looks on their faces. Bye him. So nice to see you, I said sarcastically. Bayan was the son of Brobor, our blacksmith in Korna. He was a tough kid and a bit of a bully. He surrounded himself with others who seemed to like him, but were more likely afraid of him, and decided that siding with him was their surest way to stay out of harm's way. He competed regularly in the combats, and was often in the top three finalists. I'm surprised to see you here, he taunted. I thought all this violence frightened you. Ever since we were old enough to be in the combats, he had mocked my unwillingness to compete and had labeled me a weakling. I did my best to ignore him, even though it got on my nerves at times. If he wanted to, he could crush you like a bug, Cam blurted out in my defense. Oh, really? retorted Bayan. If that's so, then why don't, won't he compete? I say it's because he's scared. I'm not scared, I replied. I just don't want to. Even though I knew it was true, it still sounded lame coming out of my mouth. Right, sneered Bayan. My little sister doesn't want to either. Cam made to lunge at Bayan, but I held him back. Just then a group of girls came by, 
and who should be among them but Alita. She caught my eye and smiled. Bayan noticed the interchange and jumped at the opportunity. Hey, Alita, come to watch me win the combats? Alita rolled her eyes. Sure, Bayan, maybe this will be your year, hey? Too bad can't watch Taren fight. He's still too scared to go in the ring. I am not, I said a bit too loudly. I'd take you on any day. It was a ridiculous thing to say. Bine wouldn't stand a chance against me. What he didn't know, what nobody knew, was that I was immensely strong. I had pulled a full-grown moose out of a swamp once. Another time I had carried a wounded bear through the forest for at least a couple of miles, but for some reason I wanted to keep my strength a secret. And now here I was, ready to put it all on display just because I wanted to impress a girl. It was crazy. But before I could take my words back, Bine pounced. Perfect, he said. Let's go right now. There's a side ring just over here. He started over to the side of the main area with his gang in tow. Cam had a big stupid grin on his face as he punched me in the arm and followed by him. The worst part was that Alita and her friends seemed excited about the impromptu challenge and were making their way over by Brian as well. Good luck, Alita whispered as she walked past. Beat him good. Suddenly all common sense flew out of my mind. Joining the others, I tied my hair in a ponytail. I didn't think that Bion would cheat, but there weren't any umpires to make sure. The crowd, which it had now become as others heard what was going on, encircled the side ring. There were more here watching our match than in the main arena. Bion peeled off his shirt, revealing a tightly muscled chest and arms. There were good reasons why he plays so well at the combats. As soon as I walked into the ring and saw the look in his eyes, the sobering reality of what we were about to do collided into me and I wanted to leave. I was not a fighter. Fighting had nothing to do with strength. Why did everyone have to associate the two together like that? I didn't want to hurt anyone, not even by him. I was just about to concede the win to him when he lunged. Before I even knew what was happening, I was down on the ground with his forearm wrapped around my neck. I suddenly found it hard to breathe. He was pulling so tightly. His buddies were cheering wildly and laughing at the ease in which he had secured the advantage. I had never been in a fight before and I didn't know what to do. I began to panic as stars began to dance in front of my eyes. I reached up and grabbed his forearm. In my desperation to escape, I wasn't concerned about being careful. And before I realized what I was doing, I heard a sharp crack. Bind screamed and rolled off me, holding his forearm to his chest. It's broken! It's broken! he cried. In a few moments, one of the combat's medical team rushed over and assessed the injury. He confirmed the break and Bine was rushed away for medical attention. One of the officials had also arrived at the scene. This is why we have referees, he scolded, looking at me grimly. So much can go wrong and we have to make sure everyone sticks to the rules. I didn't mean to hurt him, I said plaintively. Sure you didn't, he replied. Then why didn't you just sign up like everyone else? We don't need these kinds of shenanigans going on. He shook his head in disgust and walked away. And just like that, it was over. Bion's buddies had dispersed as soon as he was taken away. The girls were sickened by the broken bone and had fled the scene. Even Alita seemed unsure as to what to do. She gave me a look as if to say, what happened? And then she left to join her friends. All that remained was me and Cam. Like a bug, Cam repeated. He helped me up and I cleaned off the dirt. We stayed just long enough to watch Greg win his opening match and then left. I had lost all interest in the combats. I'm going home, I declared flatly. You can stay if you want. Nah, replied Cam, for which I was very grateful. I've seen enough. Best fight of the year and I had front row seats. I smiled despite the distaste I felt in my mouth. We left the bustling village of Kofor and began our trek home. I was ready for the simplicity of Korna. Korna was a quiet, peaceful place. Cam had often reminded me that as soon as he was old enough, he was going to move to Kofor. That's where the action is, he was fond of saying. I liked the quiet of Korna. True, there were some days when it seemed like nothing was ever going to happen, but usually that was fine by me. I had long grown used to the fact that I was probably going to die in Korna, and I had gladly accepted the realization. I caught myself wondering if Alita would be happy living out the rest of her days in Korna, and then I dismissed the thought immediately. My antics in Kofor would have just added to my stockpile of reasons as to why someone like me would be undesirable to someone like her. 
The only thing I seemed capable of doing was destroying any chance of being with her. I sighed loudly at the revelation. What? Cam asked. Well, I think I just saved myself six weeks of stressing about asking Alita to the Evenstide Festival, I answered sardonically. Why? Cam pressed. Because of what happened back there? Uh, yeah, I think that pretty much sewed up my chances with her. Are you kidding? You should have seen her face when Bayan jumped you. You could tell she didn't want him to win. Really? Yeah, and when he went rolling off you crying like a baby, she had a smirk of contempt on her face. I think she likes you. Shut up, I said, giving Cam a shove, but secretly I was singing inside. Of course, if you don't want to ask her, I was thinking I might, Cam teased. Maybe you should, I countered. At least there would never be any awkward silences. We laughed and continued our walk. Cam's friendship went a long way in helping me get over the confrontation with Mayan. As we approached Corna, something seemed strange. Can you smell that? asked Cam. Yeah, I replied. Smells like someone's got a fire going. Maybe they're burning leaves. Smells more like burning wood, if you ask me, said Cam. And there seems to be a lot of noise. We came around the final bend, and what we saw stopped us in our tracks. There was a sight that I simply could not or would not believe. Our serene village was in utter chaos.